So uh, this session is about the agrarianization and the peasantization across the global north and south. Most examples will be from the global south, but we will also hope to have a little bit of discussion on the global north. So the agrarianization and de is seen across the world today, and it's stimulated by various drivers, both ecological, political, and economic. And, in oh. <laughs> Uh, importantly, I would say, uh, even though we see the agrarianization as a trend in many contexts, this doesn't necessarily mean that abandonment of farming happens because better opportunities arise. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily happen because farmers don't value farming either. So we need to look for the reasons elsewhere, I think. Um, the presentations in this session draw on empirical examples from India, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and a little bit from Sweden. And we hope to discuss how trends are similar and different across contexts uh, and uh, uh, share our thoughts on this topic. Probably we will not have a lot of time for discussion in the end. We have five presentations. We will try to not keep them too long, but it's also interesting to hear about these different cases. But hopefully it stimulates uh, thoughts that you want to continue later during the day in the lunch break and coffee break. So first out is is uh, Flora Haidu from the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. After that, we have Andrew Newsom, which you can't see at the moment. He's online, um, and he's um, from the Department of Development Studies, University of London. He's presenting from Brazil today. Then we have David Neves from PLOS at University of Western Cape. And then we have uh, Ambarish Karamchedu, correct? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> from King's College in London. And lastly, I will present on my research from South Africa. So, welcome to Flora. Well, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Clara. And I hope I'll do justice to my position as first presenter through uh, offering some uh, thoughts that might uh, inspire some further uh, comparisons between the other presentations. As many others here at Poland, I have done research in South Africa. And here in the background, you see the village where I have been uh, visiting for the past 23 years. You can see it's been resettled under the so-called betterment program where households were moved to, to be closer together so that only quite small gardens are possible to make and larger fields were directed to the outskirts of the village. You can see sort of the fields on the outskirts of the village in this picture with all the problems that faraway fields had with being difficult to keep under surveillance from animals and so on. I have seen deagrarianization happen in this area in the past 23 years, but for this session, I started thinking about the fact that we described deagrarianization as a global phenomenon. But what are the similarities and differences across the world in this deagrarianization phenomenon? And here's an, an example of the size of gardens that people can make now in this village. They're about 0 0.5 hectares. In South Africa, I'm sure others in this session are going to talk more about drivers of deagrarianization, uh, the various problems with production on small fields, lack of fencing, droughts, high prices of inputs, and so on. Also, the supermarketization of rural areas, availability of cheap bulk-produced food, and so on, drive deagrarianization, and the consequences that people are more vulnerable to food insecurity and that there's a jobless deorganization where people don't find alternative incomes. But when I read an article about, uh, by Jonathan Rigg and Sakuni Natupalwat from 2001 on deorganization in Thailand, they described that the Thai farmers who have moved out of agriculture have instead gotten new opportunities through linking up to global markets in various ways. So this got me to think, thinking about that this is quite a different process from what I have been seeing in South Africa. Um, and uh, where like, no such opportunities had really presented themselves. And it also differs from deagrarianization in Sweden, where the good quality lands are being amalgamated into larger and larger farms, and family farms are being sold as they're not so profitable anymore, and the younger generation don't want to struggle like their parents did. Uh, competing with the large-scale farmers. They want regular nine-to-five jobs and a life where they can go on summer holidays with the family like 
everybody else in their neighborhood. Uh, so we all we call all this deorganization, and there are significant similarities, but also quite significant differences. Um, and uh, so I want to ask, like, how similar are these processes? Are the drivers similar? Is the way that the process of deorganization unfolds similar? Are consequences to people's livelihoods similar? And what happens to the land? Is that similar? And how much of this must be similar for us to talk about a global phenomenon? I've looked at dusting off the term global. This is um, a term introduced in the 80s in the business economics and marketing uh, sphere meaning local adaptations of globalizing forces, uh, often used to discuss issues such as the fact that McDonald's in India first failed completely, but then they adopted to only having vegetarian and chicken options and rice rather than chips, and now they're fine. Uh, so globalization, but with significant local adaptations. It later became to be used more widely by sociologists and geographers to indicate cultural hybridization processes and the encyclopedia definition now is the simultaneous occurrences of universalizing and particularizing tendencies in social and economic systems. So I propose that the concept of global could be possibly used to discuss processes that may look similar and be present across the globe, but have key differences locally, such as different drivers, different ways of how the process unfolds and different consequences. And using such a conceptualization can allow us to not be stuck in focusing only on the local issues, uh, and so see the global reach of various processes, but at the same time also recognize that processes have really relevant local nuances. So the question for this, uh, for uh, you, everyone, is can deagrization be seen as such a global process? And maybe this could be a point of discussion in the end too, like, in what ways are drivers' processes and consequences different or similar across our cases. So to introduce the example from South Africa, the two villages I have studied are both along the coast. The top one here is Mutwini, the betterment village I showed before, and the other one at the bottom in the more scattered settlements is Manteku. And I've been in continuous contact with these villages uh, for the past 23 years. They've been part of three different research projects, uh, and twice in 2002 and 2016, we surveyed every household in both villages. But in-depth interviews and ethnographic methods have been the most important methods used. Uh, so here you can see the deagrization process happening. The columns uh, show Kutwini 2002 and 2016 and Manteku. And you can see that deagrization has been very specifically focused on fields, while gardening has reduced just a little. The fields have been basically almost completely abandoned, as you can see on the second row, where from 62% planted fields to 2%, for example, for Tutwini. And in the next to last row, you can see that um, basically no households grow more than 75% of their own maize and vegetable consumption anymore. But at the same time, in the middle row, you can see that the average number of crops and fruit trees, that is gardening, has reduced more slowly. So basically what is happening is that, and it's continuing to happen, is that people focus on their gardens, farm vegetables and tubers like pumpkin, beetroot, onion, cabbage, tomato, taro, and spinach, and grow maize mainly for fresh consumption and feed for chicken rather than for staple food. And then they prefer to buy cheap bulk, uh, milli meal and rice, uh, rather than trying to grow maize and uh, grind it for their own consumption. Uh, and this is uh, probably a very uh, economically logical thing to do, considering that it's cheap to buy and expensive with inputs. Um, and also, as the years go by, the new generation is less inclined to start a new garden when they move to establish their own new household. So gardening is reducing as well, but at a slower pace. Uh, but this does have consequences. And uh, this is a graph about food insecurity, where I have aggregated the answers to seven questions we asked in the 2016 survey on food security. For example, how often people in the household have eaten fewer meals, smaller meals, gone to sleep hungry, or worried about not having enough food. As you can see, so this is two different villages then, uh, most of the households in both villages have not been able to answer that they never go to sleep hungry or eat less when uh, they're not terribly food insecure, they haven't answered always or often, 
but they're also not completely secure. And between 15 and 29% of the households experience food insecurity sometimes, and this includes some that answer often to some of those questions, as this is an average. And these are the most vulnerable households. Um, and this minority of households to the left that are completely secure, they answer never to those questions of experiencing science of food insecurity. They usually have more stable work or larger social grants like pensions. However, also another category belongs to this never group. And that is the households that grow more than 50% of their own vegetables. If we look at village one here to the right, and on the next slide I will, that, I will have that same graph to the left. That's the village average. Uh, and to the right, uh, with the red columns, is the answers from the households that grow the most vegetables. There's only 14 households in the village that grow around half of their own vegetable consumption. So we're not talking about maize, just vegetables. Uh, but these households, as you can see, are noticeably more likely to answer never to the question of food insecurity. And the biggest red column shows that 64% of them answered never compared to 29% of the village average. And yes, this is a small sample, but also in interviews I made with four of these households last week, they were all saying that they're not worried about food since they grow so much of it themselves and that they were not affected by COVID as much. And in fact, neighbors come to them to borrow food or even steal their food occasionally. So I think it indicates uh, the potential of increasing household vegetable consumption in order to uh, contribute to household food security in insecure times. To conclude then, my contribution to the discussion. Deagronization in this area is driven by smallholders having marginal lands in the first place, the cost of production being high, and access to relatively low cheap bulk foods, among a lot of other things. But that's a summary. Uh, and the deagronization is, however, that process is twofold. Abandoning fields went fast, while gardening is dwindling in a slower process and is driven mainly by the younger generation not entering farming, rather than the older generation just stop tending their gardens. But higher food insecurity is a likely consequence. Uh, so the organization seemingly has different drivers in different places. The processes differ and the consequences vary. Can it be understood as a global process, perhaps? A process with global reach, but with significant local differences. I invite us all to reflect on this in relation to the different presentations today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Flora. So uh, we, uh, my plan was to keep all questions and comments to the end. Um, but we could take a question for Flora if someone wants to run around with the mic while I'm setting up Andrew's presentation. So Andrew is, is presenting online. So Flora, if, you, if the rest of you look if someone wants to say something. Okay. Okay. We need to understand um, 
you know, the extent to which um, de-industrialization, de-urbanization against the back of what you might be called rampant economic stagnation over the last 20, uh, couple of decades, two, three decades in Zimbabwe now, um, history occurring, and to get a very quick sense of the history of London before which I'm going to have to rush through, a very quick sense of the history of uh, tobacco uh, production which is intertwined with the history of London before. Um, and then um, we need to kind of um, find out a little bit about, you know, I want to present something on what's happening in um, Missouri, uh, in, uh, in the Sugarland Central in, in Zimbabwe, um, by a, a very quick uh, presentation of some uh, of the qualitative and qualitative analysis that we've been doing there. It's part of a really um, uh, a research initiative called uh, ACRA, African Policy Research, uh, which, uh, uh, sorry, African Policy uh, it's, it's about an animal facing the pathways to uh, agricultural commercialization, such as our economy, and what we think in terms of agricultural policy research. There we go. It's a mostly um, uh, African uh, research led uh, initiative that's not true of the funding structure, of course, which is typically not an article in the world base. Um, but um, you know, most of the research is, is headed up by, by African uh, research institutions and by some, some amazing uh, uh, researchers such as Tobit Shoni, who uh, led loads of the work in, in, um, in uh, Zimbabwe, helped me to do the climate change work, which I'm actually not going to turn on today, really, um, which I was saying, let's change actually. Um, but it's a really cool uh, initiative. Please do go um, and, and check it out. It's, it, it, it's not just the quality of the research that's important, it is the way that it's uh, set up um, in terms of long lines of co constructing uh, knowledge and genuinely letting people who actually have to live with uh, the, the issues that we're describing here sort of define the research agenda. So, um, what I want to kind of start off with in terms of understanding the re agrarianization is, is looking at the extent. But what's kind of you know what's going on in Zimbabwe that might be different from from uh, other countries either in that it's happening at all or in the extent to which it's happening. And I'm not going to go. I haven't got time to go into it too much. But I think we all know that Zimbabwe has some significant economic issues. Um, I mean, you know, they started in the 1990s really, but they uh, continued uh, into the into the 2000s. We've seen that hyperinflation. We've seen um, rounds of uh, sanctions which have cut off Zimbabwe from, uh, from uh, lots of uh, uh, other use for, for the things that it could be exporting. Uh, we've seen, you know, there, there are so many causes as to why there is uh, not a very economic situation in uh, Zimbabwe right now. But it's, it, it's basically not getting um, any better at the moment. It's a very present kind of um, background and one of the effects has been that um, Zimbabwe's in, in industrial base has, has faltered and this has been um, compounded by a particular you know, sort of set of policies on how to deal with um, informal settlements in, in, in urban places. So if you look at the two photos um, on the bottom before and after photos, this is what happens um, when the government decided to offer to, to, in, in, to implement a single operation Murama China, which was an you know, informal settlement clearance uh, program that happened in the you know, year about 2007, I think it was, or it may, it may have started earlier. And um, I think 700,000 people were cleared from uh, informal settlements, uh, some sometimes called um, uh, in, 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 in Harare and other cities in, in, in uh, Zimbabwe, uh, this one shows you the money uh, township before and after the operation. It's just astonishing. It's not just um, homes that were you know, uh, cleared, it's also industries. You know, uh, uh, lots of kind of you know, informal and industry uh, production, uh, it, it, it was just kind of stopped. And to some extent, this is reflective of a kind of colonial you know, the mindset that was there before independence, continuing into the independence uh, period of, of wanting to restrict migration and settlement and wanting it to look at 
certain way. But what would this kind of, you know, thing look at, uh, a city like, um, I don't know, uh, Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of Congo, you know, maybe 400,000, 700,000 uh, people live in the formal family, and millions, the other millions, it's all fully informal. And that's, that's how it is. That's not the way that the mother and mother thinks about her life, for example, even if the, more of it might actually be informal these days in the formal uh, plans. Um, and you can see here the world bank rates that we have, but actually fewer people now live in the world area of this than there was the case um, you know, in, so 20 odd years ago, and the more people are living in the rural areas. This is an astonishing kind of thing that's, uh, that really is not the general you know, trend that you'll hear about those people now in, in urban uh, places across the world. Uh, a majority of them, it's 50, whatever, something percent, are probably creeping up to 60%. And yet, the world is going kind of in the opposite direction. Um, and one of the ways in which we can sort of think about this is a kind of re agrarianization. And that's not just a story of losing opportunities in urban areas and losing opportunities because of economic stagnation. Of course, that's a really big part of the story, but there are also kind of opportunities here that, that explain that those, you know, those, those to um, kind of trying to sort of for the World Bank data. And that's the, there is this opportunity, uh, there is a range of opportunities for some people to get involved in commercial agriculture. So if you look at 1980, you know, the year of independence, not, you know, 98 percent of tobacco production was done by 1,500 white farmers on large scale farms, but by 2018, you had 124,000 uh, producers registered well over 50 percent, over 60 percent um, were in a small scale uh, category, I think. Uh, they were being, you know, most of the, 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 the lion's share of the production, um, not just from small, but also from the medium scale. Um, and of course, then people start to talk about in that classic development narrative of, oh, we're seeing kind of agriculture here as a, you know, roots of poverty and hunger reduction and kind of success on those, on those lines. And that kind of you know, idea is, is starting to sort of take on. And our, our research kind of is slightly pulls cold water on that idea. But there is this opportunity um, that's coming up. And the reason that it's an opportunity is because of land reform. Before I tell you about the land reform, let me just say very quickly uh, that in order to understand the land reform, you have to understand that, like many other South African and uh, indeed Sub Saharan African countries, uh, or you know, including me and including the Maghreb as well, uh, Zimbabwe uh, emerged as a settler colony. It was set up um, with um, uh, white uh, British people who were given half the country's land, the other, they, although they only formed four percent of the population, the other half um, was, uh, was put into what we now put in you know, those common lands, which we were called native um, reserves. And the economy and the state kind of provision for supporting the kind of economy that was occurring was set up around supporting those white farmers to the detriment of, of uh, the, 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 the additional population that had already you know, been living there prior to, to <coughs> the economy and establishment of the settler colony. So after independence, um, the government um, started land reform programs on a much smaller scale. And when progress didn't come, when um, pressure built up politically, uh, in the early 2000s, the Zimbabwe government um, uh, introduced the fast track land reform program, which basically took a lot of the land back off white farmers um, to address this historical injustice, albeit in a way which raises its own question of justice because the farmers who had land taken from them and the workers, the one million uh, workers who were working there, didn't receive any compensation. Um, but what emerged from this chaotic kind of um, uh, intervention uh, were four categories of land here, which, uh, which are then important to understand in terms of this picture of reorganization and who brings the users from it. So common land states, those are the, the, the native reserves that established uh, back in the, the 1920s. Um, the, uh, you get these eight one farms, so 
which is where you can get an easy adjustment for 99 years and you get a 5 to 10 hectare plus. Or if you have a kind of plan and you have credible you know, set of resources for agriculture, you can get um, 50 to 200 hectare plus. And there are other kind of you know, historical uh, and irregular uses. You get some people who have you know, kind of farms which are thousands, tens of thousands of hectares, which is not within the, you know, the A1 and the A2 category. Uh, but that's roughly 10% of the land. It's not like the model just gave all the land to its, its elites. That's, that's not, whatever else you think of this uh, program, that's, that's not an accurate characterization of it. And of course, you have legal settlements across all of these categories, which, again, uh, complicates the picture rapidly, but I'm going to have to sort of, um, sort of uh, jump on that. But within this, the buckle, which emerges within the kind of you know, 20th century uh, set of kind of exports kind of of choice. There was tobacco production before um, whites had to start doing it, but that kind of got stamped out so that people, so the white um, farms would have labor on the farms. Uh, but it becomes this massive export across the, 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 the course of the 20th century for Zimbabwe. And it, you know, it crashes in the 2000s on the land reform process and uh, starts, but then it re-emerges. And it gets back to the level that it used to be at um, because you've got people on re uh, redistributed land being able to, to grow it. And along uh, with this, you get this emergence of new class structures, which I briefly want to talk to. How am I doing the time? Uh, yes, uh, I'm trying to tell you that your time is up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but, but please, uh, tr don't, don't just finish, but try to, try to wrap it up, so we understand the whole yeah, story. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So basically, if, if you look at kind of the sort of who is benefiting from from this, what's happening? You get these emerging classes which are uh, emerging in the redistributed land, um, and, and so, and this is where you see what what's happening with rearalization. So you get a lot of people who are still pretty precarious, about 46% of the people across our field sites anyway, um, in Missouri, who uh, have to sell some land over and farm and they're making this it's kind of quite high level of volume that's going to last levels. There's another group um, who are a little bit less, who's doing a little bit better, and they've got some kind of limited accumulation from the low level. And then there are some other groups who are much smaller in size who are doing quite um, a lot better. All of this is kind of you know, financed mostly by, by, by contract farming. Um, so there's a really interesting kind of spread and, and um, a picture of things going on. I won't talk about the future sort of research, but I think the main thing to say of, of, of relevance to the panel is that um, re agrarianization as well in Zimbabwe is probably explained by some of, um, some of Zimbabwe's particular history. But some of it, so where is the place of farmers within kind of uh, agricultural policy chains when they can do this? And to whom are these opportunities uh, open? I think that's where we see some of the greatest similarities with, uh, with a country like South Africa, which we had that really, really fascinating first presentation on. I'll wrap it up there. But um, thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to, to join the panel at, at some distance. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope you you will also be able to take part in the discussion later. Uh, it was really interesting to hear. Now uh, it's time for David Neves, and I'm going to uh, just uh, sort out the presentation again. There it is. Great. Um, thanks, very, thanks very much for that, Clara. Thank you for the opportunity to present in the session. Uh, OK. so. Um, I'm going to be talking to some of the research that I've, I've done in the, in the recent past, including towards my PhD. Um, I'm particularly interested in the dynamics around deagronization, um, how it sort of articulates with uh, livelihoods and the implications for social differentiation. Um, I mean, rather, in a rather grandiose fashion, I'm suggesting this sort of lessons from the communal areas of South Africa. Um, but I think they're sort of general questions that we can ask about. Um, uh, de agrarianization Now, in many respects, this, this presentation builds on um, uh, Flora's, because although it's, uh, the actual em empirical work has been done in a slightly different part of the, um, the former Transkei 
um, homeland in the rural Eastern Cape, um, we are looking at a, um, a former homeland communal area in, in South Africa. And um, I mean, many, many people here are familiar with South and Southern Africa, but, but if you aren't, um, here's an old map of the sort of Bantustan territories, the sort of uh, ethnic enclaves reserved for particular um, ethnic groups. Uh, and it's, I guess, where, where we've both worked is the, is the trans guy. And it's, um, it's, very much, it's, it's very much a countryside, um, uh, similar to the one described by Flora, in terms of the legacy of uh, betterment planning, sort of the, 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 the kind of colonial and, and apartheid era rationalization of land use, um, along with um, uh, the fact that it's essentially been a, a labor reserve. So the research I'm talking, I'm talking to draws on um, several, several years, in fact, um, 13 years of uh, qualitative participatory fieldwork, but also a whole lot of um, quantitative analysis, including um, of uh, stats SA uh, census data, which looked at a number of, which looks at a number of um, development sort of indices, but also incomes. And I use this as a lens to, to understand and, um, the fundamental question of how is it that um, people survive in the, um, in the, in the, communal, the communal areas of the Eastern Cape. And um, rural livelihoods in, in this context are constituted through, um, they're marked by diversification, migration, and kind of livelihood externalization as well. Um, despite being rural areas, they, they're kind of profoundly connected to urban markets, product markets, labor markets, um, uh, because of the sort of 100-year legacy of circular uh, labor migration. Um, and the, the sort of oscillatory urban-rural migration kind of persists to the present day. It's, a, it's very much a feature of South Africa, and it, it, links, it links together the communal areas where roughly a third of South Africa's population continue to live with um, the urban sort of metropoles. Um, so th these, are, these are sort of urban sites where, as, as we saw from Flora's presentation, quite low levels of, of agricultural um, production, or at least um, a, a far from exclusive reliance on um, agricultural production for, uh, for, for local food needs. Um, so these are areas that are kind of profoundly connected to the larger agro-food uh, system of, of South Africa, but in fact, even a um, the sort of globalized food system. Um, I mean, these are uh, poor rural people who consume um, uh, leg quarter chicken imported from Brazil and um, confectionery made with whey protein from the European Union, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, livelihoods are constituted through sort of links to formal and urban labor markets, often sort of urban, urban kin migration, uh, welfare transfers, social grants, um, which uh, have um, increased in recent years um, with, um, during the sort of uh, COVID period. Uh, essentially a third of South Africans used to receive a um, unconditional state cash transfer. Uh, that number is is well in excess of 40% now. Um, and I think uh, it's in thinking about rural, um, rural dynamics uh, across the sort of global south, I think it's quite important and useful to, to flag the increasing role and place of cash transfers. It's, um, it's very difficult to imagine a current country in Africa that does not have a cash transfer program or pilot program. Um, uh, these uh, unconditional cash transfer programs have, have, have really been sort of extended across even um, very um, impoverished countries. And they're increasingly a part of the puzzle in understanding how it is um, rural people survive. Of course, there are various informal economic activities um, which still sort of exist in, in the South African context despite the strength of a powerful concentrated formal economy and land-based activities and, and endowments. Um, and um, it's, it's in this context that uh, we've, uh, through my research, we, we drew on qual and quantitative data and have sought to understand in a particular, 
these very particular geographical context across three villages, um, processes of uh, social differentiation. And what I'm, what I'm drawing on here is a, um, a household livelihood typology. And it's, it's indebted to the work of um, uh, Dorwood and, and Schoons. And we've just heard Schoons' name in relation to um, Zimbabwe, of course. So, so this, is a, um, this is a typology of, of livelihood tra trajectories that I've, I've, I've sought to adapt to the South African context. And I've mapped to um, survey data and administrative data and essentially uh, sought to um, categorize uh, rural households and former trans guy in, in, into these categories. Um, and I, I'm going to sort of talk, talk to them. Um, so at the, at the uh, sort of upper end of a, a putative um, uh, uh, sort of sequence of livelihood sort of positions and trajectories, you have the elite moving out households. Um, these are rural households that have, these are the sort of most conspicuously affluent or at least uh, least poor households in rural areas. These are invariably the ones with better quality homesteads and assets such as usable vehicles and generators and things like that. And they're often very conspicuous and in participatory wealth ranking exercises, people within villages normally have no problem in identifying them as, as the most affluent. So, so the thing that distinguishes the sort of top 5% of households, and we can see them in the income distribution, they are literally the top 5%, um, is um, their sort of job market linkages, so that typically somebody in the household will have a, a solid um, um, a, a urban job or, or a local job, um, perhaps a nurse, a teacher, policeman, something like that. Um, but these are also typically the households most inclined to in, engage in high value diversification, both sort of farm and non-farm. So these are the households with larger numbers of cattle and these are the households most likely to, um, in, in this area, be cultivating a, um, a homestead garden, sometimes with, with paid labor. Now, beneath them, you have a, quite a large strata of middling households, and they, um, they're characterized here as inching up, um, not a very sort of metric term, but these are sort of incrementally strengthening their livelihoods, and they, they're typically marked with quite, by quite sort of, you know, if they have jobs, quite sort of poor, sort of low-wage jobs. Um, uh, this, this hierarchy, this, this schema, isn't as crisply articulated as it, as it would be in um, rural Zimbabwe, where, where the differences between households are often more kind of marked because there are these, these sort of stronger opportunities to, to get ahead through agriculture. Um, but in fact, what's revealing about this um, typology is the extent to which um, agriculture is simply a sort of an adjunct to households' um, livelihoods livelihood activities. It's, it's, it's not a sort of major driver of their livelihoods or in fact their, their kind of relative position relative to other households. Um, beneath them, uh, beneath the middling households, you have sort of poor and vulnerable households hanging on with weak or past jobs and they might engage in very low levels of small scale agriculture and limited diversification. So if they diversify into non-agricultural activities, these will be less lucrative. So this won't be the spaza shop, this won't be operating a rural taxi, uh, and typically, um, if they have cattle, it'd be two or three heads of cattle, um, or some, some fowl, or small livestock, um, relatively limited um, agricultural production. They don't have the, um, uh, the capital to, to fund agricultural inputs. Um, they don't, they don't, they can't buy fertilizer or replace fences, etc. And then, sort of, the, the nethermost, the, the lowest um, dropping down households, these are the most sort of vulnerable of rural households, often female-headed. Um, they're characterized by the fact that they have no linkages to, to labor markets. These are the households without urban kin working and um, sending remittances. Um, they, they're often actually so poor that they don't have one of the, the two higher value social grants. So these households, these lowermost households in income terms, they're so poor that they're below the threshold of the state old age grant, uh, the social pension, that's 2,100 rand um, per month, or the disability grant. Um, so it's, it's in fact, um, and of course, uh, the, these households don't engage in, 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 in any kind of um, discernible agricultural activities. They're 10 to 15% of households. 
Um, I can see Clara's wanting to draw my attention to the fact that we're running out of time. But what I want to sort of use, um, what I want to sort of use this uh, Go ahead. typology to sort of draw attention to is, I suppose, kind of three critical questions. The, the first question is, is how we understand um, uh, de agrarianization and, and the whole problem, the whole problematic of de agrarianization relative to sort of larger trajectories of um, national and, and economic development. Of course, de agrarianization is only a thing, it's only a concern um, when, the, when the industrial and, and urban labor market is unable to absorb rural populations. So that's the that's the first um, question. And in and this respect, you know, South Africa and its former native labor reserves is sort of further down the, um, the kind of road, the route of, of de agrarianization. So there are these larger questions about is de agrarianization the problem, or, or in fact, is the, is the problem the sort of larger structure of, of the economy? Um, I think there are also a set of questions around how to conceptualize de agrarianization. And there's, of course, um, there's always been debate about the causes, the consequences, et cetera, of de agrarianization. But, but even the sort of terminology, so there's, a, um, there's a intriguing evidence of, of kind of re agrarianization, sort of, uh, especially sort of post COVID, and in very particular areas for very particular kinds of people and households. So it's sort of marked by these processes of, of social differentiation. But I've always thought that de agrarianization and re agrarianization are kind of inadequate sort of terms. Well, why is it re agrarianization? Why is it not un de agrarianization? Or, um, you know, sort of post de agrarianization. You know, what, what exactly is the sort of, are the, the assumptions about um, uh, the trajectory and the sort of backsliding? Um, inherent in, um, in sort of development. And then the sort of, um, sort of final, um, sort of final uh, question I sort of want to pose is, is the whole idea of, of, the, of our often implicit uh, normative, political, even sort of moral um, notion of, um, uh, of the agrarian as, as virtuous. Um, and therefore, as uh, de, uh, de agrarianization often framed as um, a problem. Of course, there are um, uh, sound arguments for um, supporting small scale agriculture where it's, where it's viable and for sort of plucking the low hanging fruit. Um, but I think there are often um, quite sort of deeply held normative um, sort of assumptions about the nature of, of the rural and the kind of the bucolic pastoral um, and, and a kind of a strand of agrarian popularism that, that sometimes colour how we understand um, the phenomenon. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm uh, Ambi, I'm a lecturer in international development at uh, King's College London. Today I'll be talking about um, de agrarianization and non-farm uh, livelihood trajectories in uh, semi-arid uh, rural India. So an enduring belief continues within uh, agricultural policy in India and beyond in the global south in the agricultural modernization framework it continues to persist in policy making. Um, you know, this is taking the historical precedent uh, from the agrarian to the industrial transformation in the global north, but obviously ignores you know, the role of imperialism and dependency. Um, agricultural commercialization is, is predicted to uh, increase economic growth, and the belief goes that the cross-fertilization between agriculture and uh, ag agricultural incomes and non-farm investments leads to industrialization, et cetera, and creates new job, job opportunities outside of farming, pulling people out of agriculture, like in the global north. Um, however, you know, critical analysis by agrarian political economy scholars has often observed that um, smallholder farmers in the global south often continue to persist with agricultural commercialization without actually realizing the gains, uh, and neither are they dispossessed fully uh, into wage labor full time. Instead, they're reliant on fragmented farm and non-farm incomes, and this is kind of what I'm going to be arguing today. 
Um, livelihood transitions from agriculture to non-farm livelihoods are not a function of rising productivity and income from technology adoption, but as what um, Singh and Pogal uh, refer to as a distressed-induced transformation, which um, they define as crisis-driven factors such as falling productivity, increasing costs and decreasing returns, unemployment and underemployment and uh, indebtedness. These push factors force the agricultural workforce uh, towards non-farm activities. So factors such as decreasing land quality, uh, size, uh, climate and environmental change, rising uh, input prices, household expense costs, and commodity price swings have made um, commercial agriculture uh, unremunerative, uh, especially for uh, smallholder farmers. So as outlined uh, by Clara in the initial slides, uh, this process has contributed to de-agrarianization, defined by Hebbink as a process producing social, material, and biophysical conditions that are not conducive to the reproduction of agrarian livelihoods. Uh, agriculture increasingly provides insufficient income and employment opportunities, pushing people to uh, work off the farm. So income in insecurity from non-farm livelihoods is common in the global south, and so reflects the uneven nature of uh, capitalist integration, whereas, uh, where de has thinly spread the number of livelihoods without actually improving the overall conditions in uh, what Christabel Kay calls uh, these new ruralities. So just to give a brief context about uh, India, where I did my research. Um, so India, uh, despite, uh, I guess, uh, differing opinions, remains a primarily rural country. According to the latest NSS survey in 2019, 70% of the country's population still resides in rural areas across appro approximately 93 million households. Um, and actually, but over the last 30 years, the share of the Indian workforce in agriculture has actually declined from 61% in 1991 to 43%, both in percentage and in absolute terms, actually. Um, however, Himanshu describes agriculture as a form of actually disguised unemployment. Um, and this is kind of highlighted by the fact that without non-farm incomes, 25% um, of India's smallholder farmers, so these are classified as under two hectares, um, they would actually fall under the poverty line. So that's, that's quite a, you know, a telling statistic of the reliance on non-farm incomes. So, but if you look closely at the nature of the non-farm labor market in India, it reveals that since 1991, uh, since economic liberalization, approximately 92% of the 61 million jobs created, uh, this has kind of uh, been shown in... Um, five-year uh, NSS survey since 90, from 1993 to 2018. Um, yeah, 92% of the f jobs created have been informal. Uh, Non-farm livelihoods have largely coalesced around three to four occupational categories in rural India, which is um, agricultural labor, uh, construction, transportation, and casual service work. And so, as Jan Raymond says, guarantees such as monthly salaries, pensions, sick pay, and holiday pay are obviously absent offering actually only a marginal improvement uh, to agricultural incomes. And so, uh, and this has been worsened since the financial crisis in 2008, where the labor market trajectory has only worsened these precarian, precarious employment conditions in the non-farm sector, um, uh, causing uh, jobless growth. Um, so the period from 2010 to the present has actually seen an absolute decline in workforce size, um, slowdown in job creation in all non-farm sectors, um, rising youth unemployment despite educational attainment and the withdrawal of rural women from the labor market um, altogether. So this indicates that India, as India is undergoing a truncated and messy structural transformation from an agrarian economy, the rural workforce seeking to exit the sector unable to be absorbed in the non-farm sector in both rural and in urban area, urban area, uh, India. The absence of decent work, even when available, has entrapped people into becoming what Jan Bremen calls wage hunter and gatherers. And empirically, this is starkly shown by the fact that actually even accounting for the pre-COVID period, um, statistical uh, representative sample surveys between 2012 and 2019 have actually shown that the absolute numbers of people in rural poverty in India has actually increased from 217 million in 2012 to 270 million in 2019. And this has only increased further um, during COVID. 
Um, so a bit about uh, the methods and the area that I'm researching. So the empirical analysis for this presentation is taken from eight, uh, eight to nine months of ethnographic fieldwork in the, between 2018 and 2019 in the uh, South Indian state of uh, Telangana. So Telangana is a new state which was formed in 2014, but um, it remains a primarily agrarian state by employment, counting for 55% of the workforce, but only 16% of the GDP. Um, Smallholder farmers with under two hectares of land account for 88% of the farming classes in the state. So Telangana um, underwent some rapid, um, actually, agricultural commercialization since economic liberalization. Um, it was previously a dryland, uh, millet, uh, sorghum uh, growing state and subsistence farming state without much irrigation, it was rain fed. Um, it experienced rapid commercialization of its cropping patterns by uh, genetically modified cotton, uh, rice and groundwater irrigation, which rapidly actually increased uh, economic growth. However, um, Telangana is one of the highest rural indebt indebtedness rates in India due to of, um, often agricultural commercialization, and gains from this process are highly stratified by uh, class and caste. So the research uh, involved 94 semi-structured interviews and 151 household surveys uh, in the village of uh, Kuchimanchi in uh, South Telangana. So Kuchimanchi is a typical dryland village located in Nalgonda district in South Telangana. Um, it's 15 kilometers away from the nearest, um, I guess, like periphery, rural periphery town, and 110 kilometers from the capital city of Hyderabad. It has a semi-arid and drought-prone climate. 100% um, of the farmers grow BT cotton, rain-fed as their cash crop. Uh, adult literacy rates are 19%, and annual incomes are around $2,000. So farmers largely rely on agriculture, but also agriculture and construction labor in the dry season. So um, experiencing enduring economic pressures on their subsistence livelihoods from increasing reliance on markets for education, healthcare, food and fuel, farmers in the village in the 1990s aspired for BT cotton, a high market price GM cotton, which is also rain fed. They availed cheap credit to finance their investments um, and BT cotton was adopted by 85% of household as a monocrop, cash crop. Um, household surveys in 2018-19, however, revealed that 69% of all categories of households, um, which I'll show in the next, next slides, uh, made a loss or broke even from BT cotton, as farmers experienced frequent harvest failures from leaving BT cotton rain-fed, driving up household indebtedness from lost input investments. And also to increase agricultural productivity, in under two decades since its introduction in 2000, farmers drilled around 215 wells for groundwater uh, by about 66% of households. Um, however, and this was intersecting across uh, class and caste. However, by 2019, 89% of all wells drilled in the village failed due to declining monsoons and competitive drilling for finite groundwater resources, pushing farmers into debt traps as with BT cotton and increasing reliance on non-farm livelihoods. So, however, the pressures from farm losses, well failures, rising household costs were compounded by interest repayments of 24% to 36% um, per annum, forcing them to earn a living outside the farm to survive. Just got two more slides. Um, so amidst the fallout from agricultural livelihoods, 70% of households in Kuchimanchi actually relied on non-farm livelihoods for consumption and debt repayments. Despite households self-identifying as farmers, the most important income source came from outside the farm. Non-farm incomes are therefore largely a distress response to failings in agriculture, representing an adverse economic tr transition from agriculture to non-farm livelihoods. Non-farm transitions have been dominated by low-skilled wage labor. Uh, Manrega, which is a, a welfare uh, job guarantee program, um, and construction labor. And crucially, similar to David's presentation, 25% of annual household incomes come from government tr cash transfers. So without that, they would be even worse off. Um, and yeah, uh, the non-farm income sources are low paid, insecure, and irregular, earning three to seven, yeah, three, three to seven dollars per day, um, which are completely insufficient compared to the rising debts, interest repayments, and household expenses for food, fuel, medical expenses, and education. So this is shown by this table. It's quite complex. So just focus on the, the right-hand side, the, the two columns. Um, so, calculate, so I calculated household incomes, expenditures, interest repayments, and imputed labor costs for Kuchimanchi. 
And overall, from the right-hand side, the top right, we can see that across all farming uh, levels, um, farmers made a net loss of $1,550 in 2018-19, a gravely financial situation from a culmination of precarious livelihoods, and only one category, which were the uh, widowed households, um, actually even managed to break even. Everyone else made huge losses. Um, so, for example, uh, average household debts in Kuchimanchi were $3,500 across class, caste, and gender. And interest repayments alone on these ranged from $840 to $1,250, which is 40 to 60% of total annual household incomes. Um, so servicing just the interest repayments was a very difficult task, as farmers often needed to do this to take out, kind of take out new loans uh, to survive. Just, yeah, last slide. Um, so in this presentation, I've demonstrated how smallholder farmers have faced distress-induced non-farm livelihood reliance from rising indebtedness, climatic extremes, and dryland intensification. Agricultural commercialization is a driver of distress to exit the farm, and this has been shown by BT cotton and groundwater intensification. Neither has the increasing reliance on non-farm livelihoods corresponded with better incomes. As I showed, net losses in even uh, overall taking into account non-farm incomes caused a dual agglomeration of farm and non-farm uh, distress. Thank you for listening. Thanks very much. Um, I hope you also have the energy to listen to my presentation. So I will also talk about a South African context and also from the former Transkei from the Eastern Cape, different part of the Eastern Cape than Flora and David have talked about, um, but the wider history is, is very similar in this place as well. So my presentation builds on mainly my own field work since 2006. Uh, drawing on a combination of participant observation, household surveys made in 2008, participatory wealth ranking, and interviews with the same households in a total of four villages in the Eastern Cape, outside Flagstaff, and also household surveys with one, uh, all, all households in one of the villages in 2022, shorter surveys. And also it draws on uh, some work of a master student of mine uh, who did two months of field work in 2020, Elin Jonsson. So I'm, I'm presenting work that we're currently writing about together with Shona Shackleton and Vernon Visser from UCT. And the quote here, uh, it comes from an elderly woman in one of the villages and it expresses a frustration shared by many of my informants that there is no longer any cooperation around farming activities. And this uh, many express make it difficult to farm. So in my presentation, I will highlight this lack of cooperation as a key challenge to continuing farming in the fields today. So in this context, similarly to how Flora described, households were uh, moved during betterment. In this case, it happened in the, well, it started in the 50s and it was a dragged out process with the field areas finally uh, constructed in the end of the 70s. So fields are located outside residential areas. And uh, as you will see in the presentation, uh, especially planting in the field has been reduced a lot over the years. So I will connect this lack of cooperation that we see locally in farming uh, to wider historical and contemporary political and economic forces, as I see as an important reason for the local situation. The studied villages are located in one of the poorest districts in the Eastern Cape. And it's also clear that the COVID-19 pandemic made things much worse for many households. In the local wealth ranking uh, that I did with all households uh, in 20, 2008, people decided on four local wealth groups. And I see many similarities between these wealth groups and what David described in his presentation from, from different locations in the Eastern Cape. So people defined uh, themselves and each other as rich households, middle households, poor and very poor households. And I, I have written some sort of uh, key features of these different groups here on the slide. But in general, uh, also similarly to David, I would say that only those classed as, as rich by local me measures can be seen by any other measures to be non-poor. 
at least in terms of financial and material assets, but also those classed as rich are still significantly marginalized in many other ways. They generally receive poor education, they have no access to infrastructure for sanitation or waste, and they are far away from hospitals or good quality schools, for example. Each household has a small home garden, and the majority of households also have fields as, at a distance from the household. Gardens, uh, I would say, are planted by as good as everyone still today, uh, but only a minority of fields are planted today. And in general, most households uh, purchase most of their food. Nevertheless, farming remains culturally important. So this quote is from a single mother in 2020 who said, I do farming for the sake of my children so they don't see other houses with maize and then we don't have it. Even if I'm tired, I will do it. So for her, having maize in your garden was a sign of that you have a proper household, I would say. And, and that was a more important driver than, than the food that the maize gives, which is uh, very small uh, in the overall food consumption. So our argument in this paper, which I will summarize in the rest of the presentation, is that so we draw on Habermas' uh, uh, life world and system, and I will go into that a little bit later. But uh, we, we try to frame this at, as that colonization of the life world of farming has led to a situation where cooperation and mutual understanding in farming has fallen apart in these villages. So importantly, I want to say that this does not mean that farming has become unimportant for people, and it also doesn't mean that people do not cooperate around other dimensions of rural life. But what I see is that cooperation around farming activities is, uh, is diminishing. And the lack of cooperation in farming has made it particularly challenging for the poorest households to continue farming. And indeed, the households that still planted their fields in 2019 uh, they were only households classed as middle or rich in the, in the local wealth ranking. Here you see one of the maize fields of one of the more uh, successful farmers in the village. The South African situation of the agrarianization is deeply impacted by the colonial and apartheid measures to enforce labor migration, as you have heard from other presentations both today and yesterday. Several authors have described how farming was undermined as black South Africans were squeezed into limited land areas in the so-called homelands for the sake of forcing able-bodied men and women into uh, urban labor and farm labor on the, on the large farms. So limitations on both land and labor made farming into a backup activity, providing partial subsistence to rural household members and the pension security for the migrant laborer. So the agrarianization started already during the colonial era in, in these areas, which is a bit different from, from some other places. But it has increased in recent years, despite of the lack of other income bringing opportunities. So as you might remember from the previous slide, from, so the, the fields in 2008, 57% of the fields in these villages were planted. And at that time, uh, people talked about that as a significant decline from the past. But in 2019, only 15% of the fields were planted. So I want to just briefly say something about Habermas' uh, concepts of life world and system. The life world can be understood as our shared and taken for granted experiences or understanding of the world and it's seen as socially and culturally constructed. When new situations fail to embed in the life world, it's represented by that existing interpretive schemes fail and mutual understanding is lost. This can also be seen as in how solidarity is falling apart. Habermas describes how as societies grow and modernize, it's inevitable that social relations become at least partly governed by a functional logic and by strategic action. Um, but it's when the system of modern societies takes over in a way that undermines local mutual understanding and solidarity that problems occur. And Habermas talks about this as colonization of the life world. So in our paper, we essentially outline two waves of colonization of the life world of farming in this context. 
And the first wave can be seen in what Habermas would call a process of juridification. And in this case, it would be the use of legal force and bureaucratic measures to undermine farming during the colonial and apartheid regimes. This is seen in the creation of the homelands and in the later betterment where households and fields were moved by force. And also, as you heard yesterday, by different, different laws and taxes uh, that served to particularly undermine uh, farming in these areas. So I will not go into details about this here, but our paper supports other studies showing how labor migration made farming less central in the rural life world and how betterment shattered social relations in farming. So one example of the, social, the shattered social relations is the abandonment of the plowing schemes, ilimas, like we heard about yesterday, where, where the ilimas were very vi vibrant, which is not the case in these villages. Many, many of the older farmers talk very passionately about um, the usefulness of ilimas in the pot and are very frustrated uh, with that uh, there aren't any ilimas anymore and no one wants to help out each other in farming. Another aspect of this is how people widely described cattle damage to crops, resulting in what was locally referred to as sloppy herding. People, people have been talking many, many times with me when I've been in the field, and I know that others here have heard the same. They complain about other people letting their livestock into the field areas and that livestock damage crops. And this is sort of a, a self-reinforcing process because as fewer people plant the fields, uh, there are more empty fields, and it, it doesn't... Uh, it's not so problematic to let the cattle stray anymore because few people will complain. So if you're the only one farming in the field area, uh, it's difficult for you to, to actually do anything about that someone's cattle destroy your crops. And there are several partial explanations, I would say, to the problem with herding. Both that, that fewer people plant the fields, but also that people have fewer cattle, and fewer people have cattle. And in the, in the past, uh, households would pool resources to pay for a herder. And, and uh, herding, herding was more of a, something that you actually went and did outside in the, in the grazing areas. But now, no one, very few at least, pay for a herder. And there are some young people just pushing the cows around uh, quite near the households. And um, th anyway, the solution to this sloppy herding that people are very frustrated about. It has not been to, to actually uh, gather in the community and, and discuss how to solve this problem and to come up with a communal solution. But what has happened is that uh, the rich and the, the, the wealthier households who are engaged in farming, they have fenced their separate fields. And I would say that this is a highly individualized response to the problem which further supports the conclusion that social cohesion is, in farming is falling apart in this place. And also, it's, it's only the wealthiest that can afford to fence their own field. This is not an option for the poorer households. I want to say something short also about the second wave of colonization that we talk about in the paper. And that's the, it, it's both stimulated by the supermarketization of rural areas, that, that supermarkets are very present in all parts of, of rural areas and, and uh, cheap, processed food is cheap uh, and accessible. And there are more taxis also uh, to very remote places so it's easier to get to town. But also these agricultural development programs that have been going on since, since uh, the start of democracy. And these agricultural development programs that I've, I've studied a few of them in in detail in these villages and their engagement. And they have been, I would say, obsessed with reducing what they talk about as a dependency syndrome, which according to the agricultural development programs was arguably created by the plowing support programs during apartheid. The dependency syndrome, it's believed, has made people lazy, and therefore they need to be stimulated to become entrepreneurs and the masters of their own life. So I would argue that this, uh, this uh, well, it, it's very, <laughs> it, it, it's completely misdirected, this, um, this mindset, I would say, that drives the development programs. And I would say that the dependency syndrome talked about is, 
more specifically the dependency on state-sponsored plowing support, and it's, a, and it's an outcome of that the fields were forcibly moved outside uh, household areas during betterment. And it was moved away from households, and we also show in the paper that I won't go into now that the poorest households actually have their fields furthest away from their, uh, the field furthest away from the household. So it's clear that those, those households who did, they weren't in a position to negotiate a better position for their field during the betterment, they are worse off today. And the focus on individual entrepreneurship and wealth creation in this agricultural program also further stimulates the disintegration of solidarity in farming and the introduction of new hybrid maize and GM maize seed, which also undermine uh, solidarity and cooperation as you're not allowed to share seed. Although, uh, in this case, with regard to seed, I see a continuing solidarity around sharing seed and, and people have widely continued to share also GM seed with each other and with people who need seed. So, in conclusion, and I'm also late, <laughs> like, like some other uh, presenters. So we suggest that de-agrarianization is an outcome of decreased mutual understanding and solidarity amongst smallholders, but it's caused by wider political and economic factors. First, the violent oppression and legal undermining of farming, and then increasing infiltration of capitalist relations in rural life. And it hits the poorest and the most marginalized farmers the hardest. So uh, with that, uh, a bit depressing presentation. Uh, I will stop and um, let's, let's take time for some question and discussion. Should I have a question? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was um, just wondering about the, the similarities and, and potential intention between uh, a Leibniz approach and uh, an emphasis on classic pronunciation. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Andrew, do you want to start saying something and then we'll move to people in the room? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I'm not sure I have um, a clear answer for it. I'm, I'm still not quite sure on what, what is the tension between thinking about livelihoods and um, thinking about class emergence. I, I don't think you can explain either without understanding why the rural urban relations. Of course, you know, that's been a clear you know, first time's kind of labor class approach. It's not one that we've used sort of explicitly, but you might expect I mean, people to tell us that I that I would have I mean this is to a is kind of um, slightly more kind of um, it, 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 it probably is it's kind of it's not probably too far away from Bernstein um, but it's kind of broader sort of political economy of class and agrarian structures hanging out. I don't think it's even particularly on on on, on Bernstein. Um, and, and I think that of course um, I mean maybe I'm just not understanding uh, your question enough uh, uh, no but I think for me what we're kind of seeing in the data, especially in, in Zimbabwe, because of the land reform, it's just so different from pretty much anywhere. You know, nobody does this kind of experiment. It's kind of, it's fascinating. You know, to see possibly the emergence of new class structures. You know, like, where, where else do you get the opportunity to study that empirically? And for me, this sort of 
that, that then, you know, it's, it's different from the kind of, you know, say, you know, Jonathan Rick style, Southeast Asia kind of um, differences between the sorts of diversification from agriculture because of the stages of development, because there are opportunities for people versus the stress diversification that we've seen in a lot of panels kind of, um, today. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's different in, in kind of, in, in, in Zimbabwe because it's, it's, if you don't have that kind of urban economic kind of push at all, you have an urban kind of sort of economic sort of push back. There's nothing there to, to go into. It's not there's nothing there to go into. There are, you know, there are some things that can be supplied, but it's so it's it's just not the same relationship um, at all, you know. But but you do get this um, and in terms of say tobacco production, for those who've been able to find it, it's such a revolution to go from 1,500 large scale people dominating tobacco production that have the same amount of production now, or slightly higher than it was before they crash, um, and have it being done by all these small holes. There is something really massive about that that has changed. Um, but I guess the, 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 the link there between the livelihoods that are emerging and class is still there, like we see in the other field sites. Um, the people who are able to invest in their agriculture, in their tobacco production in particular, are the people who perhaps kind of, you know, for a long period of time have been able to do that because of their position in society, for instance, as, as, as an elite. And there are people who are starting to have opportunities of that hill um, coming through because they've got their own land, because they are somehow hustling for kind of the input for need, mainly to the contract kind of uh, agriculture. That doesn't work for some people very well. It keeps them all very much on the margins and, and doing a kind of uh, tobacco work probably they shouldn't, especially not from a climate change perspective. But, but, but the livelihoods and the off, especially the good off farm um, opportunities correlate pretty well with class to me and the bad ones correlate with the lower kind of class emotion structures as well. So I'm not sure I see the contradiction, but perhaps I don't understand your question very well, but no, I'm sorry to say thank you so much. Hi, that's, that's good. We, ha we have a, con a continuing comment from David. Um, yes, so I think that was a really interesting question from Noé, and, and the answer, it's a, it was a theoretical question about the relationship between sort of livelihoods and um, a more class analytically informed Bernstein-esque classes of labor, uh, are, there, are there links? And I, th I think the answer is yes. So the short answer is y uh, yes, definitely. Um, I, I think um, uh, dis despite the sort of descriptive power of a livelihoods approach, um, I'm always reminded of Bridget O'Loughlin's comment that uh, sort of livelihoods approach is a, is a method in search of a theory. Um, and I, um, I, I definitely think that there's uh, a lot of utility um, drawing on a kind of class analytic sort of uh, lens, particularly the way in which um, Bernstein understands it in terms of classes of labor um, and, and the kind of the flexibility um, and fluidity of, of labor uh, to, to sort of deepen the explanatory power of a livelihoods approach. Yeah. Thanks, and I have a comment uh, that sort of relates, but well, I wanted to sort of challenge this uh, issue of that uh, diagonalization should be mainly a problem uh, because there's no jobs available. Uh, because, I mean, what kind of jobs are we talking about there? And Barish was describing in India how jobs were really precarious and no decent work and so on. And, and uh, I think that's happening all over, uh, that people from rural areas uh, are among the marginalized or, uh, people uh, also in urban areas getting the worst kind of jobs and rural jobs. I've, I've heard so many stories of really exploitative conditions in rural plantations, mining, and some of these are activities are illegal and people don't have any sort of power to uh, ask for a decent wage or decent working conditions. So. Uh, I think so many of those jobs are not really helping people to move forward in any way. So uh, in the absence of, of la decent labor regulations or the implementation of, of existing laws, 
maybe we have to sort of move away from this dual, like either people should be subsistence agricultural, uh, subsistence farmers or uh, work, uh, and see that there's also some middle ground there where people can build their own livelihoods in rural areas uh, where agriculture could be one component that may be and make cash transfers or remittances or previous work yeah, incomes could build some of these uh, local livelihoods that people build for themselves based on like transport, local trade, local building, construction, repairs and beauty saloon and whatever, where people actually work for themselves, they're not exploited and so on. And, and I'm not saying everybody will be able to do this, but it could be one component that we're missing, these diversified different kinds of things. So that's just a comment from me. And maybe, maybe the, yeah. the, um, the concept of deorganization as such misses the fact that many people do and will continue to uh, mix livelihoods and, and, and the, ur the urban and rural linkages will have been in many contexts really important and continue to be and it will not be either agriculture or uh, urban work, it will, uh, it, it will be both. And, and I think it's fruitful for many households to find uh, a way to, to make these complement each other. Then at, at the same time, uh, in some situations, I think it, it, can, it can really be a distress situation where agriculture doesn't produce what you need and, and the work you can find takes, is so hard and takes so many hours, so you cannot work in agriculture at the same time. Um, do, did you see uh, some? Yes, good, go ahead. Okay, thank you. It's Tembela Vimbi from Sanbi. Um, I wanted to pose a question and a comment to the last speaker um, and the other studies that were focused on Eastern Cape, especially Transkei, it's quite close to home. Um, <laughs> um, and I wanted to give insight in terms of understanding the dynamics of the, the farmers, agricultural, the uh, lack of cooperation. And I want to shine a light on um, the matter with the cattle and all of that, and the herders, all those issues. Um, I think also there's other underlying factors when it comes to that because there's outsiders that come to these communities to steal the cattle. So if you had your cattle far away as a header, you have to be there the entire day to watch it. Um, so there's all these socio-economic factors that are all interlinked. Um, and also I'd like to add in, in reference to all of the um, presentations, well done on all your studies. But I think we need to also incorporate um, a level of understanding this is how the world works now, like all these external factors that affect our economy and affect the livelihoods of local people. And to maybe move towards or add on to our research how we could better equip the people to infiltrate those um, systems of the world um, and how they could instead of complaining maybe or shining the light on the disadvantages of them being excluded from the system and how we could better equip them to be a part of the system, to be a part of the, um, the people that will supply the bigger markets of their food and all of those things. And I think as South Africans we have collected a lot of information, shine light on what's actually happening, and I think it will be s greater step to incorporate solutions and to help those people to understand that the world is moving, it's not gonna stop, the system is the system. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, now we have several questions, so we have to stay a little bit more and comments. I, I, I don't feel that we need we don't, we shouldn't really, that, that was more like a comment, it's not nothing that we need to respond to, but one thing that I could say that uh, uh, I, I think that better, more appropriate and more uh, available agricultural advisory services would make a big difference. I think if, if farmers had more uh, available and locally adapted support, uh, it would be much easier to engage in agriculture. Um, I think that that's one important component. Who has the mic? Yeah, go ahead. I have one of them. Um, thank you so much for all your presentations and for this really interesting session. It's really nice to see all the cases together. Um, and I have a... I've, I've just been wondering and wanted to throw out the question to you all. Um, I've 
I've been wondering about the, the kind of ecological dynamics underneath the, uh, that intertwines with the first phases of people constructing and building their livelihoods from, um, from both labor and agriculture, and, and the chances to kind of go back and forth between um, farming when they can and, and, and uh, not. The, the one problem that I see and that I experienced in the former trans guy as well is that sometimes you can't go back to farming because there's uh, there has been ecological degradation or uh, bush encroachment, um, and of course those things take a lot of uh, resources to, you know, it takes a lot of resources to clear all those acacias um, uh, or wattles that, that kind of come in. So I guess my question is, uh, just if you find it interesting, to reflect a little bit on um, how can we bring those ecological dynamics into thinking about de-agrarianization going forward? Thanks. Do you want to say something? And, <laughs> and um, yeah, I can answer the second question. Um, yeah, I think it's going to make things worse. I mean, that's kind of the unobvious point. Uh, in kind of dryland areas which I've looked at, the, the difference between previous kind of cropping patterns was farmers having the knowledge and the practice and sharing uh, methods to diversify their cropping patterns according to the dryland environment. So using crops that are suited for dryland environments, using crops that are used for fodder um, as well as household consumption. And one of the biggest kind of forms of destruction through this commercialization is hedging risks, all the risks onto monocropping. And this has kind of been a uniform uh, necessity to keep up with household income. So unfortunately, I think the ecological degradation part is just going to make things worse, which is more risk and more uh, resources invested into kind of high value crops to try and eke out a return. Um, yeah, that's what I think. Thank you. Can we, so, um, can we take the, the raised hands in the audience uh, and then we can try to say something. There's at least one. Where, and where is the mic? <laughs> um, yes, okay, so we'll just take Rachel's comment and then I'll invite you. Then, then we need to wrap up in case, in case someone wants to have some coffee before the next session that starts at 11. <laughs> my, my comment actually goes on the last one and I was going to say, ask something quite similar. <laughs> Um, especially in the Indian context, which mirrors, I think, many of the South African experiences of BT cotton, where farmers adopted it and then, you know, 10, 15 years down the line, have more or less abandoned and are highly in debt, often using child grants to, you know, continue to buy the seed that was initially provided as an incentive package by Monsanto and the state. And I'm sure there were similar drivers in India. But I'm wondering about the opportunities that, th that exist, given the climate crisis, given the fact that dry land crops like millet are now becoming much more attractive in the market, and I think could be a really viable opportunity to look at uh, agriculture quite differently. And, and certainly, I mean, there are pockets of that, I think, happening in different parts of the world, but I'm wondering if, if there's any inertia or, you know, what's, what's the situation in places uh, like where you were working to look at those opportunities? And is the seed available? Because that's, I think, the crisis that we're finding is that farmers lose their seed and then really struggle to, to relocate that to, to start planting it again. Thanks. So I'll, I'll let Ambi uh, respond to that, and then I'll invite Andrew, and Andrew's comment will be the last one. And if someone feels like you need to go and get coffee, you just just do it. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for the question. Um, so the constraints and the inertia for moving away from BT Cotton is kind of the, the economic incentives. Um, so the belief amongst the farmers, I kept asking them, you know, why do you still persist with this if this you last saw kind of success every few years? And they said, 
because that one year of a successful harvest is enough to clear all our debts and um, you know use some so they have that enduring belief somehow still that there is going to be that one good harvest um, so that's the first thing and the second thing was farmers themselves when I posed that question of why don't you start you know diversify move away from BT cotton grow millets grow ground nut uh, chickpeas that are suited to the environment and they said who's going to pay for my you know my expenses and my household costs that's all great but the market incentives um, maybe there should be state incentives for example linking maybe cash transfers to cropping diversification and like in a positive way or farmer producer organizations to scale up production for the market but that currently isn't there so at an individual level um, there is no incentive to move to millets because the immediate pressure is to repay the debt today and to pay for all the expenses today and they think that continuing with cash crops is the only way even though they know it's failed a lot yeah thank you thank you i i um i'll give the word to andrew online Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the ecological question, uh, it's really big, of course, in more than one side, I'm sure. We did a study on climate impact in, in Zimbabwe, and it's just frightening quite how, and though you didn't think about the projections for the future and all the uncertainty associated with them, in the last 40 years in Zimbabwe, the rainy season has, on average, shortened by 30 days. You get up to three weeks with no rain. Um, so for people who are doing rain-fed uh, agriculture, you are kind of um, sometimes screwed. And so pushing people towards the battle, which, to link to Andrew's point, that's what you can get finance for. You can't really get finance for like a book or, or um, you know, a good one would be sweet potato. There's a market for that in Ferrari. How do you get access to that market? For instance, the Macro and Yeda, that is sort of informal traders who buy cheap and sell um, very expensive, what Marcus Taylor and the Indian context is called um, relational vulnerability, where some people are feeling strengthened at the expense of other people's and they get the common vulnerable. Um, it's, it's, this structure is towards tobacco. If you can make it work with tobacco, uh, then great. Um, it's, you know, some people can, but, in, but an increasing amount of people can't, and especially in common areas. Um, you know, it's, there's a lot of production there, some of it's working, but a lot of it kind of isn't. And it links to this question about how do we help people deal with global conditions? Well, I mean, of course that's what we need to do, but if global conditions um, are one of the adverse incorporation into relations to capital for um, a, you know, a, a larger proportion of people uh, around the world trying to make a living, um, and so, you know, I don't want really to oversimplify it, structuring that's what it tends towards, then that's a massive question. It's not just a case of um, kind of have we got the right technical support in place. That's a political project, right? So um, I'll stop there. But thank you very much. Thank you. I, I think uh, we, we need to wrap up. Uh, and it would have been really nice to continue the discussion, but it's also nice to stop when you still have lots of ideas and things to talk about, because it means that we will need to reconnect and continue this discussion in other forms. Thank you very much to all the presenters, and, and thank you very much to all of you in the audience who were listening and commenting and staying long into the break. Um, and I hope that we will continue talking about this in the future. <laughs>